Okay, we're on. Hi, India. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. All righty. All right. Yep, go for it. Hey, everyone. Um, like Karen said, I'm India, and I'm a product specialist for Demonstrated Success, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar on non-invasive progress monitoring strategies. We're happy to have you with us today. I'd like to introduce Karen Matto, our Director of Professional Develop Development and Literary Curriculum. She will be your presenter today. I'm here to answer your questions as Karen moves through the presentation. Before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to the control panel so you know how to ask questions and get handouts in our polls. First, everyone on the webinar is on mute to avoid interrupting noise, but if you have a question, please feel free to type it in and I will stop Karen, then she will answer your question. Also, there are handouts attached to the handout section at the bottom of the control panel. At the end of the webinar, if you wanna stay on to ask any final questions, we'll happily unmute and chat. Also, the webinar is recorded and posted on our Demonstrated Success resource site. All right, with that being said, Karen, we're good to go. Thank you, India. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Happy to have you here. Um, the I'm Karen Mazzo. <laughs> the um, I just want to show you what's attached at the, in the handout. So underneath in handouts, the first handout is a certificate of participation. So you can use that, download it, and fill in um, your name, and you have an hour of PD credit. And then the second handout is the directions to log into our site. In about 24 hours after this webinar, there will be a recording of the webinar and then also some additional handouts that I will upload that you can use. And I'll show you where in the PowerPoint what handouts uh, I plan to upload. And then I just uploaded two documents that I um, found from other sources that were amazing resources for um, assessment, formative assessment strategies and just really non-invasive ways to find out where your kids are in the classroom. And I'm happy to elaborate on any of those. So if during the webinar you download that and you're going through it and you have any questions about any of those, when we get to the last section of the webinar, um, you can just write in and ask me and I'll talk more about them, assuming that, um, I know about them. <laughs> All right. So welcome. And I want to, there's me in India. Hello. There we are. Um, just a little bit about me. I am a K through 12 literacy specialist. And um, for several years, I was the RTI coordinator at York Middle School in York, Maine at the district level. So that is where I got a lot of my experience around progress monitoring and thinking about progress monitoring. Um, in addition to that, you know, um, and you'll see in this webinar, I don't, I'm not going to stick to the traditional definition of progress monitoring. But in addition to that, we do a lot of PLC work and RTI work through demonstrated success and, um, and then full classroom work as well. So I'm going to kind of run the gamut of progress monitoring and informative assessment here. The page that you're looking at right now are the directions to log into our site. So as I said earlier, that is attached to our um, handouts section. The, this is a picture of what you will see when you log in. All of the develop, professional development resources that we put out there are all uploaded onto this site. They're free to anybody. So everything here is, um, is yours, so have at it. Okay. So I wanna talk about today progress monitoring and the definition for our webinar. I wanna, I'm gonna go through a lot of progress monitoring strategies some of those strategies will be considered formative assessment. Some of it is strict progress monitoring, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. But I tried to break up the information that I'm going to offer into these four categories, thinking about individual progress monitoring, small group progress monitoring, and whole class progress monitoring.
So, oops, sorry about that. There's really one major goal today, and I don't, you, there's no way you're not gonna meet this goal <laughs> because I am basically gonna offer you tons of strategies, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So hopefully you'll leave with some that you actually wanna use. I wanna make um, some definitions clear about progress monitoring. So I'm thinking today, I've expanded the term progress monitoring really to mean formative assessment. Progress monitoring is formative assessment, and um, I just wanna clarify formative assessment for a second. It's, it's any of the variety of methods that teachers use to gain information about student needs, student comprehension, um, academic progress, behavioral progress as well. And formative assess assessment happens during instruction, right? So if you're in a lesson or you're in a unit um, or during for high school, if you're thinking you're in a course, right? So your teachers are constantly engaged Good teachers are constantly engaged in formative assessment, of which progress monitoring, the official term progress monitoring, is, is a form of formative assessment, okay? This is just a little graphic. Um, we all like John Hattie. So this is a graphic from um, his Visible Learning book, and the formative, uh, formative assessment system is um, answers for both the student and the teacher, right? Where am I going? So for the student, where am I going? How am I doing? And where am I going next? And then for the teacher, it says, where are we going, right? Where, is, where am I going as a teacher? What are the, what are the instructional goals? How, am, how are my kids doing? And then in relation to that, how am I doing in my teaching, right? And then where am I going next with my instruction based on how my kids are doing? So that's just to clarify form of assessment. Now, progress monitoring has different meanings to different people. As a special education teacher and someone that is engaged intensely in, um, in response to intervention, right? Progress monitoring is focused on um, you're the students that you're intervening with in like a tier two or a tier three intervention. And that's, that's how we think about progress monitoring. I don't like to get too hung up on definitions and because I think that it's intimidating to teachers and they feel like it's something they can't do. So I'm, Officially, uh, progress monitoring is you're monitoring your students' response to instruction, right? Which is what we're doing when we're doing any sort of formative assessment, right? You're estimating the rate of improvement, identifying students who are not demonstrating progress or students that are demonstrating lots of progress, right? And you also might use progress monitoring to compare the efficacy of different forms of instruction. It's the same thing that you're doing when you collect any sort of formative data, right? So it doesn't have to have a fancy name, progress monitoring, right? Anytime at the end of a, of a class lesson, when you collect formative data, you're reflecting back on the efficacy of your instruction, right? And you might try something new the next day. If you're working in a RTI format and you're working with kids that you're intervening with, right? You might use progress monitoring to track an intervention, and or several interventions, the progress monitoring of the kids that are receiving those interventions to compare the efficacy of the interventions. Okay, so it's two different contexts, but it's really the same thing. So, but for progress monitoring in the classic sense, you're using short assessments that are valid, reliable, and evidence-based. So RTI would say that they have to be evidence-based. Um, I don't always hold to this because it makes it seem like in order to progress monitor, you have to buy something. And you don't have to buy something. I think for your most needy kids, if you're working in tier three, um, yeah, it's good to have a valid, reliable, evidence-based tool. 
Okay, and that's what, for instance, we use Ames Web or Dibbles for. But in your regular instruction, you can create tools that will allow you to publish monitor that aren't necessarily evidence-based, that they haven't done research on, okay? And um, in the time frame, it, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And so this just speaks to you are assessing them at regular intervals, depending on the skills that they are acquiring. So for instance, if you're progress monitoring comp reading comprehension, right, you're not going to progress monitor that every week. If that is a skill that is complex that it takes time to make progress with. So you would want to progress monitor comprehension every you know, month or six weeks, maybe. Whereas if you're doing single digit addition less than 10, you certainly can progress monitor that every week. Any questions so far? Looks like we're good. Thanks, India. So when we progress monitor, we're trying to figure out, are students making progress at an acceptable rate? Are they meeting their short and long-term goals? And do we need to change the instruction? So the, the question of rate is very significant. Um, when we think about progress monitoring, that's the reason that we do progress monitor. Without progress monitoring, you could invest in an intervention or an instructional strategy that is really not doing the student any good. And unless you progress monitor at regular intervals, you're not going to know that. So, you know, my favorite examples of this are some of the reading programs like Orton Gillingham and and the Linda Mood Bell program that I've used, or, and you, you get kids, or Wilson, right? So you get kids that do Wilson in fourth grade, and then they move to the middle school, and they get Wilson for another year. And there's no um, telling whether the Wilson's working, right? So, and no one has progress monitored to indicate whether, the program is working or not, and so you lost your opportunity. You, you lose your window to change the intervention unless you're doing um, ongoing progress monitoring. So I think that when, especially when you're doing direct instruction and you're doing intervention, that progress monitoring at a, at a frequent um, in, at frequent intervals is is very important. So I just want to. This is your classic progress monitoring graph that I want to point out to folks. And you know, the, the other reason, so the other reason that I like to only use that strict definition of progress monitoring um, with your most needy kids is that if this is time consuming, right? So unless you're doing tier three and tier maybe tier two intervention, right? You it's hard to find time to graph students. Um, progress. Now, you, m many of you know on the webinar, if you don't know, in Performance Plus, there is a tool where you can enter progress monitoring data and it graphs it for you. Um, the same as I think you can sign up for, there's a, a few different sites where you can get this done as well. But if you want to talk with me about um, Performance Plus and how to put your intervention data in there, it's really fabulous. I mean, you can also create a graph for your students, and after you're done working with them, you can fill in the graph right after they leave, the same way that you do anecdotal notes. It just takes a little front-loading, because you actually have to create the graphic. Um, just in terms of interpreting these two graphs, I just wanted to make sure everyone understood. The idea here is that at each assessment um, event, right, on the, you're marking down the student's performance. So on the, the left-hand side, on the horizontal, sorry, vertical access, um, axis, it says digits correct. So I'm assuming that this is something, um, this graph came from maybe an addition, a short addition um, probe. And uh, on the bottom, on the horizontal axis, you have the time, the duration. So this is weeks of instruction. So the first week, you know, you can see on the left-hand side for the increasing scores, 
you know, the student got 50 digits correct, and then they went down a little to 45, and then they went up again to 50, and then they went up again to 55, and down a little and up a little. But what you see there is the trend line, right? If So you can draw a straight line through. The trend is certainly a growth trend. Whereas on the right-hand side, um, the same sort of graph is being connect um, created, and you can see that the trend line is flat, whereas the goal line um, is, is, is higher. And the way that you do that is you, at the 14 weeks out, you put an X or you indicate on the graph where you want the student to be, right? And then if you draw your line and it's clear that the student is not going to get there, then the student is not making the progress that the student needs to make to meet their goal, which then means that you need to change your instruction in some way. So you can change your intervention, you can change your frequency of intervention, you can change the configuration. If you're doing a group, you can try small group, you can do um, longer duration, you can again change the strategy. So, and that's how those decisions are made in formal progress monitoring situations, which again, you, um, in the best possible circumstances, you're able to do this with students that you're working with in tier two and tier three. And the probes uh, are very short. So you might work with a student for a half an hour, um, you know, four days a week, and the last five minutes of that half an hour, one day, like on the, on the Friday, you might give the student a probe and then mark down their performance. And this, this graph just speaks to progress monitoring as a tool to see what interventions are working. Um, on the left-hand side, you see words read correctly. And then on the horizontal axis, you see the week. And what this is, basically, each of these lines, if I'm working with several different groups of students and I'm administering three different interventions to those groups, let's say, I have, um, you know, group A, group B, and group C. I've, I've weekly, I've averaged their performance on the assessment and plotted it on this graph to show at average, right, for those kids, for each group, where the kids are, which allows me, if I graph all three of the different interventions on the same graph, it allows me to actually see which intervention is most effective. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about one-to-one -one progress monitoring strategies. And um, curriculum-based measures are one particular way of progress monitoring and um, for individual students. And those are some of the criteria, right? Um, the some of the important things are that the materials that the students are using should be very similar to classroom materials. So it shouldn't be an independent testing event or it shouldn't feel like an independent testing event, which is um, part of what I want to emphasize in this webinar is that what I'm trying to convey to you today is some opportunities for progress monitoring that do not uh, take away time from the classroom and that are not formal testing events. So curriculum-based measures are very, 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 very small, harmless <laughs> um, sort of testing events. So they're aligned to instruction and they are not norm referenced. Uh, they're criterion referenced, which means there's criteria and the student has to meet the criteria, right? So if the criteria is the student has to add numbers, um, you know, less than 10 successfully, then that's the criteria and the student does that. But you're not norm referencing it. You're not concerned about what, you know, if student A is being asked to do that, you're not holding student A in comparison to student B, C, D, E, and F, right? So it just has to do with that particular student mastering that particular skill. Um, the procedures should be standardized, uh, more or less, um, and usually with curriculum-based measures, 
what we mean by low inference means it's there's not a lot to interpret right so if you are using a rubric let's say to interpret a piece of writing right that's high inference whereas low inference might be if i give a kid a list of words to read they either got them right or wrong there's not a lot of judgment and you're going to use the same measurement over time at regular intervals so you're weekly right you might give a student a um, CVC spelling um, probe, we're going to call them probes instead of assessments, uh, every Friday to see how well that student is responding to the phonics or phonemic awareness and, and phonemic awareness instruction that you've been doing during the week. On Friday, you might give them a five question CVC um, spelling probe. Right? So that's going to be the same thing over time with the same pattern. It doesn't have to be the same. It shouldn't probably be the same exact words, but it's going to be CVC, CVC, you know, five samples in the CVC words. Um, definitely time efficient. And it doesn't, it, you know, it's not a content based assessment, it's skills like, um, yeah, like reading CVC words, um, writing words per minute. Uh, I have another slide right after this to show you some examples. Um, it often can be scored per minute so that um, the probe itself doesn't take very much time. So these are some examples of curriculum-based measures right here. Uh, at the high school level, middle school level, when students are performing, you know, past basic skill domain, um, it's a little bit harder to create curriculum-based measures. One that I can think of that you can do is the number of words that a student can generate or the number of correct sentences, right? So if you look at number six, if you're having students that are having trouble producing writing, right? That's something that you might be able to um, create a curriculum-based measure for. So, you, you know, you establish a period of time in which the student will have to perform and on an ongoing basis, you know, once a week, you have that student generate a certain amount of, you know, you give them a student period of time and they, they will generate a number of sentences, correct sentences in that time. So that's, that's an example of a probe that you can use for older students. Sorry about that. So this is not, I don't want you to get hung up on these two definitions, but I do want you to understand the difference because it helps when you're thinking about creating probes for curriculum-based measures. Mastery measurement versus general outcome, it's pretty simple. Mastery measurement is small discrete skills one at a time. Whereas general outcome measures are more um, like you'll take the learning over the course of a unit or a semester and the assessment will include different skills. So I'm gonna show you. Um, and if you, you look at this at the bottom, um, look at these two graphs, the mastery measurement. Uh, the green. The only thing that is being assessed in each of those intervals is a single skill, right? So we have multi-digit addition. That's what we assessed for from you know for the first four weeks, or I think yeah. And then we assessed for the next however many weeks, that's six weeks, seven weeks, um, multi-digit subtraction. Whereas on the one on the right, those things, those skills were mixed. Um, if you look at words correct, um, linear words in the aim line, and so if you see the one on the right I'm trying to describe. Over time, that's measuring how many examples the student got correct, but those the examples in there are mixed. Um, so mastery measurement, again, is the, sh the short, very narrow instructional objectives. And those are some examples, so like letter formation, reading patterns like vowel silent E, addition and subtraction facts, right? Very, very small, discrete objectives. And that, that's just an example, right? Adding four digit numbers, period. Um, 
Whereas a general outcome measure, a student needs to apply several skills and um, it's a longer period of time. So it's more over either the annual curriculum or the half year and um, it helps you to design your instruction going forward, right? So if you, let's think about it this way. If you were to give the kids a unit assessment, a unit pre-assessment, right? So a general outcome measure is more like a unit pre-assessment where you give the students that assessment and there's a lot of mixed skills in there. And the students know and you know that there are things in there that they're going to be able to do and things in there that they're not going to be able to do. And then when you give them the benchmark or the mid-unit assessment, right, they can do more in there. Not everything, but more. And then when you give them the final assessment, right, the hope is that they can do everything. So that's more um, uh, indicative of a general outcome measure. So I did want to show you at the, at the bottom where it says example, oral reading fluency. What's interesting about that is that you would think that it wasn't a general outcome measure, but you realize that in order to improve in oral reading fluency, there's a lot of skills that have to happen at the same time, right? So you have to use the letters, recognize the letters, the letter combinations, you have to blend sounds. You have to use syntax. You have to, you are applying content knowledge, right? So in, if you improve in any of those single reading skills, your fluency is going to improve. So we don't always know when we do fluency measures why a student's fluency is improving because you can't discern the individual skills. So this is just an example of a um, general outcome math assessment. And you can see here that there's different skills on the assessment. And that's just what I wanted to show you. It's a computation assessment, but there's division, there's multi-digit addition, and so on. And this is, um, this is just an example of when we, we do reading fluency. Okay, so these are some resources that I wanted to share with you. They're excellent resources. Intervention Central and Easy CBM. I was an am, like when I first discovered these, amazed that these resources existed for this kind of work. I'm just gonna go here for fun, see what comes up. Um, this is the, you can sign up. Whoa, let's see. You can sign up to this, it's free of course, which is lovely. And there's um, progress monitoring measures. Um, there's interventions that you can create, right? Uh, it's, it's pretty great. I'm just gonna keep, I can't help but want to. So you can see here that there's reading fluency measures for different grade levels. You can choose the grade up above. This is just third grade. And I keep going down, there's numbers and operations, geometry. So just to show you that um, there's some great tools on there. And this is so cool too, because you can actually paste text in here. And I'm gonna show you a picture in a little bit. Um, and it can create for you a fluency, um, we're all reading fluency passage where the numbers will be at the end and I'll show you that. This is um, Intervention Central. There is, um, you can, this is again where the, the fluency passage generator is. If you see over on the right hand side where my cursor is, you can generate math worksheets, um, addition, subtraction probes, all sorts of computation probes, letter naming fluency so that um, you can put in a certain number of letters and, and I'm, I'm gonna show it all to you, all right? But I wanted to show you that these things really existed. So I'm gonna keep going, because I have some. So this is where you put in the oral reading fluency. So I put in a piece from um, Charlotte's Web here. You might recognize Mr. Arable. And when you print it out, this is what it comes out and they alternate the colors so the kids can discern you know, from sentences and so that to help you with your running record as well. 
you can see the number of words on the right hand side you can see at the top there's a place you know to put in examiner and um words read correctly and and so on and you can time your students and then you can have you know um comprehension conversations and so on so i thought that was kind of cool and this is a quantity discrimination that i created at intervention central where you put in the range and the you know the student has to identify you know which is greater which is less than so and you when you do this it's timed right because automaticity is really a key key piece of that basic skill development uh, they found research has shown that automaticity is is really essential to um, to discrimination to for math facts Obviously, for symbol discrimination, it helps with uh, with reading. You know, the faster that you can discern and identify any sort of letter or, or number symbol and and produce um, sound for it and so on. So we you do curricular based measures can really build automaticity. Um, this is the letter naming pro here. So I put in. Uh, I don't remember what I put in, but you know, if you give this to a young student and you do this weekly, and you can record either the number of you know letter names that the student can generate or the letter sounds. I prefer letter sounds um, because it really helps with professor pre-reading skill. And by the way, you know, just um, I'll talk about this graphic organizer in a second, but you can also, if you don't want to use um, you can just make this yourself. Just get on the computer. And I do this exercise with kids that have trouble discerning the letter P, the letter B, the upper, the um, lowercase P and B and D. And so I will create sheets like this and only use P, B, and D and um, give the student the probe weekly, and uh, if not more. And it, it very quickly clears up uh, that discrimination issue. So this is this tracking sheet is just an example of a data sheet. You know, there's thousands of these available on the internet. So this is just an example of one of them where this is the student's target. You can write it up there, and then you just write the date, the score, the date, the score, the date, the score, and you're good. And um, you know, again, the graph is ideal. But sometimes people get overwhelmed with the graphing. Uh, so that's just the way it goes. <laughs> but I think in Intervention Central, you can actually have it generate a graph for you. But you have to pay a little bit of money. OK. So what the curriculum-based measure, the, everything I talked about till this point had to do with sort of formal curriculum-based measures and the definition, the formal definition of curriculum-based measure in terms of RTI. I'm moving away from that now. Conferences, I'm gonna talk about student conferences, which is also one-on-one -on -one progress monitoring, right? Um, but it is not a curriculum-based measure, and or not formally in terms of the official definitions, but in some ways it is, right? It's based on curriculum. Um, and it's not different from from what your the kids are learning so i just want to show you a few different ideas for organizers to um, keep track of conferences with students right so this is just an organizer for math conferences right here and you can see on the left hand side that you can um, have the student's name up there and you know you might walk around with your clipboard and you have one sheet for each student and um, every time you meet with them you have a date and you have the skill and the question um, that you're asking you know, the students and there's a place for observations and then you can just check off what strategies the student did and used and I think it's a really nice organizer. This is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit in a second about conferences for literacy and I wanted to show you this. I'm going to upload, I'm going to go back, I'm going to upload this conference sheet for math, and I'm also going to upload to our site, the Coaching Tour to Target, and all this is, and I'm not going to go into it, is some tips on effective 
coaching, when you're working one-on-one -on -one and you're doing, sorry, conferences um, with students, literacy conferences. So, uh, but that's not the focus of this webinar. So, but I wanted to put that in there so that you would have it. And in terms of conference monitoring conferences, I'm, I'm offering you here just a few ideas for keeping track of your conferences. Conferencing with students, it's a very tight process, right? I'm sure that all of you have had that experience where you're just running out of time, you can't get to the kids that you wanna to get to, the end of the week has come. So it's really important to have a really tight conference protocol uh, for yourself. And part of that is having a data collection sheet that works for you. So we have, this is for um, conferencing for an individual student here, and you can write down, you know, whatever, it's the same thing over and over and over again. Author, date, how, you know, the student's reading aloud to you. Is it easy? Is it just right? Is it challenging? Have that conversation. What is one strength? What is the conference focus? And you can circle that and so you can see that that's a, just a really nice conferencing sheet and I can upload that. Um, this is a different way of doing it. You, um, it's just different format. It's less structured. It doesn't have the um, language, the prompting language in there. It's just got the date and the touch point and your observations and next steps. So that might also work for, for some people. And this finally is a rubric that you can use in your conferencing with students. Okay, so we have um, just some, that's a lot of language. And there's language there that allows you to make um, a level distinction between four, three, two, and one, and how the student's doing in terms of their retail, their opinion of the book, um, how they did, and what they, um, strategies that they use. You can see there on the bottom how all of the strategies are there for their decoding, um, using pictures, initial sounds, chunking, small words, word families, and so on. So I thought that that was another nice option. And again, I'm gonna upload these resources to our site. So this I wanted to talk a little bit. This was a new use of conferencing. And a lot of us spend time in our classrooms trying to develop students' metacognitive strategies. And this, what I'm about to show you is a tool that I have used to talk with kids about how they're learning vocabulary. Um, and this just outlines, this slide is outlining how you might use this. And the goal here is just that students should be able to articulate a couple of strategies that they're using that are effective for them and to use some self-reflection with you about what strategies for learning vocabulary are most effective. And in the, the idea is here that um, you will have used these different strategies throughout the course of the beginning of the year, right? And then you wanna have a gradual release, <clears throat> a transfer of responsibility. So then students slowly become responsible for um, selecting their own models. And hopefully, at some point, their own vocabulary, right? Um, and then after that process is in gear, after an assessment um, that you've given them involving unit vocabulary, you can have conferences with students and use a form like this together where you look at the student's performance on the assessment and you talk about some of the words that the student um, knew and didn't know and then have a conversation with the student about, well, which of these strategies did you use to learn that vocabulary? And if you compare the strategies that they used and then look at the vocabulary that they knew best, right, then they can self-reflect on what strategies are working best for them. Okay, so that was a different way of um, progress monitoring through conferences with some of the metacognitive strategies. Just with, um, I know maybe some of you on the webinar don't know what these things are. The semantic word map, semantic feature analysis, word map diagram, and the Freire model are four very um, prominent strategies for vocabulary learning. And if, again, if you want to talk with me about any of them, I'm happy to. Um, you can just shoot me an email.
and I can send you resources and we can have a virtual meeting. So now we're I'm moving away from the uh, one to one and thinking more about what am I doing when I'm in my classroom and I'm running small groups, right? So I may have leveled math groups. I may have reading groups, um, skills groups, and whatever. So I want to focus a little bit on some ideas for progress monitoring in groups. Um, what we're going to use now, I'm going to show you, um, you know, you, you want to come to your group with a chart for each student or a chart for the group where you have a space to write for each student and a clipboard and a pen and the text. Um, so you come to your reading group and you have a document like this, right, that you will have completed beforehand. So just to go back for a second, if, if I'm looking at inference, right, before I come to that reading group, I will have reviewed the passage and I will have generated a series of questions that I'm going to uh, probe with the kids. And I am going to write those questions down beforehand, okay? And for each student, right, I'm going to have a chart that looks like this. So I will have um, some questions for inference around setting, que questions that um, require a student to infer around characters, around plot, and around main idea. And here we've, I've divided it into open-ended questions and then targeted questions. And you're going to write the questions there. You can fill it out beforehand. And all that you need to do is basically indicate once you're there with a check whether the student was able to answer the question or not, right? And, um, and it's just a really easy way while you're doing instruction to collect progress monitoring data. Now, it takes some front loading as all these things do. Um, but if you are going to try to collect progress monitoring data in a non-invasive way, then there is going to be behind the scenes work that, that has to happen. These are some more um, tools to use, just to go back for a second. Um, this is a, if you're working with a math group, right? So you might have a group, let's even say you had a group of four kids and you have your clipboard and um, you're gonna have a, the student's name up top and um, what you're working on under data or how you collected data, whether it was through observation or whether it was a short quiz and you can put the notes down and the date, okay? So there's one, and then here's for um, a more open-ended one, right, where you have the student name and then some notes. And maybe that's what you can handle during your guided math group, and that's fine. Uh, the important point uh, part is that you choose a monitoring technique that works for you, that you can stick to, and gives you the information that you need. Um, this is a, a yet another example um, where uh, I've used this um, when I was doing a, a unit on area and perimeter and the kids were having trouble with problem solving and I actually used this with an intervention group that I was working with. Um, we did a two week intervention after a, a unit. And what I did here is I put the students' names uh, on the left and then at the top, uh, horizontally across the top, I would put the date. And for those students, um, I started the intervention with a probe, a four to six question probe that um, asked them to solve several problems of increasing difficulty uh, involving area and perimeter. And then I intervened for six days. And then during the intervention time, I would also collect daily data so you can see where it's not gray. I would either, I would put um, a plus, right? So the student excelled, a check was okay, and a minus was not so good today. And then after that, where the gray area is again on the seventh day, I administered another probe of four to six questions, which were of equal rigor um, and had them, and, and then no, um, sorry, documented their performance. So I did the same thing again seven days later. Um, you can actually use the same probe 
day one and day four, and maybe you might even be able to use the same code the whole time. Um, depends on how aware the kids are and what's happening in between. So you can experiment with that. So I just want to give a plug for self-monitoring. India, are you here? Yes, I am. What time is it? It is 3.04. Okay, thank you. I just can't, uh, 404, and I can't um, see the timing on my computer. Oh, I'm much. sorry. I keep from forgetting. I'm central. Yes, it's 404. Oh, no, 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 yeah, no, no, it's okay. I just can't see my time on my computer, so I just want to make sure I don't run over. You're good to go. So, um, this slide, I, I liked, I just, it's it, self-progress monitoring can be as easy as giving students, each of your students, these four cards. Right. And at the end of a lesson, you can have them hold up the card that they um, feel represents their understanding of the lesson. Right. You can have them on their way out of class, on their way to lunch, um, put it in a pile. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways, but making the cards and giving them out uh, and putting in that front loaded work will get you a long way. Because then after every single um, lesson that you teach, you can ask them this and they will understand and it will become routine. And that feedback cycle will become very normal for them, which I think is um, really fabulous. And I'm a big proponent of, ha of having students self-assess. Um, this is just an example of having students um, self-assess their own self-advocacy, right? We're always trying to get kids to be independent learners and to try to self-reflect on how they learn. And um, so this is just a, an example of us having, you know, having a student think about, consider, you know, what they did when they didn't know um, what was going on or when they didn't understand the lesson. So we have um, students going to clock themselves for five different events and see what they did and then self-reflect on that. And you can um, debrief with students around that. So that's some really important information for you and for students. Whoops. Okay, sorry, that was a mistake. I was stuck in there. So I wanna go back um, to the final category, which, um, is really formative assessment and I'm going to show you for whole class. I'm going to show you my favorite video. It's only it's less than a minute long. So I'm going to show you um, this particular <laughs> One way that I person. like to collect formative assessments is using my uh, end of class stoplight method. Before you leave, I'm going to quickly give you a sticky note. I want you to either write one of these three things. Students use a post-it note to, first of all, write either what they learned and post it on the green light what questions they considered posted on the yellow light did you consider an idea a question or you're going to tell me what you considered and oftentimes the most important if anything stopped their learning during class and put that on the red light really helps me understand not only what went well during class but also what i need to do to prepare for the next day okay So I wanted to share that with you. I really like her. Um, I can't, Sarah Wester, whatever. So when you go on Teaching Channel, <laughs> you can look up her videos. Um, and if we work together again, if you come to other webinars, I will probably use her as an example again. Uh, oh, there's a question. Can I download the self-assessed color charts? These are great. Oh, good. Yeah, I can. Um, I can, yeah, I can find them. Okay, thank you. Okay, couple more. All right, so we are, we are, I, just, I wanna let you all know that we are far away from curriculum-based measures now and from RTI, right? So I have taken the definition of progress monitoring out of the official RTI and special education land now 
and um, so that you can apply it to fun, think about it in terms of full class. This is definitely more like, you know, formative assessment. Um, but I just want to show you the possibilities. Like there's so many possibilities for collecting information about how your students are doing. So um, I don't know if, how many of you on the webinar do reciprocal teaching? I'm, um, I'm a little bit of a proselytizer around reciprocal teaching. It's, um, it's a really nice collective way to have kids learn and practice um, metacognitive reading strategies. And it has actually been reviewed and shown to be effective. It's, so it, it is evidence-based and it's enduring and it's been used since the 1980s and it doesn't, you don't have to buy anything. And I think it's fabulous. And if you wanna know more about it, um, then send me an email and I will talk to you about it and send you resources. But there's basically role taking. So students read um, text together in a small group and each person has a role, a little bit like literacy circles, except the roles are metacognitive strategies. So the students rotate and practice together and help each other through the text with each student um, demonstrating, you know, each of the roles, which is the each medic cognitive strategy. So you have a predictor, a questioner, a clarifier, and a summarizer. And this rubric gives you gives the teacher and students right criteria to think about how they did in their role. And so one of the things that I've done is when I've used this to help me collect data about how students are doing in their roles and how they're prog progressing in taking on these medicac taking ownership of these metacognitive strategies is I created a progress monitoring data sheet so you can see here um, that I have the students name that's on the left and then I have the dates and so that while students are working in their reciprocal teaching groups I can then go around and sit down with different teams and collect data as I hear students um, demonstrating their roles. So I wanted to share that with you and emphasize that you really can create progress monitoring tools to fit your needs. Don't be intimidated. If you can come up with a learning goal, then you can come up with a way to keep track of progress. And again, if you want help with that, I am happy to, to do that. And you know, any, any observable behavior you can track, and it, it, it may just take some thought. Um, this is a, an example of a rubric that you can use to um, collect data. It's a cooperative work rubric. Um, and you could you know, create a sheet to chart students, and same thing as you just saw with the reciprocal teaching, right? All you need to know is what are the goals, right? If I want students to listen to others, make a chart, put the student's name down, keep your data. That's that's really it. Um, oh, look, we got to the end just in time. <laughs> All right, so that was an abrupt ending. Um, if you have any questions, then feel free to write them in now and I will address them. By the end of the day tomorrow, you will be able to access this recorded webinar and I will um, find and um, upload the colored cards and other resources that I've shown in the, um, in the PowerPoint. So I do just want to show you really quickly the, um, this handout before I go. Um, it's very good. These are, there's 60 examples of ways to collect formative data on your students for whole class. This is all, you know, formative assessment data, like exit slip types of things, right? So there's 60 ideas here. And I, I want to just credit this person, Kay Lampert, um, who compiled these. I don't know Kay Lampert, but I found this on the internet. And, um, they're amazing and you know i mean even me there were some new ones for me in here too um and if you go through this and you want to talk about any of these i uh, feel free to connect with me and i i probably will be able to go into great detail on 50 out of 60. all right so get in touch and thank you for attending the webinar um 
and I hope that you got a lot out of it. So take care.